Good evening. I'm Carolyn Vega, Associate Curator of Literary and Historical Manuscripts, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Morgan Library and Museum this evening. Tonight's program is presented in conjunction with the exhibition, Tennessee Williams, No Refuge But Writing, which if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, will be on view until May 13th and open after the program. The exhibition traces the life and work of the playwright from his earliest years as a struggling author, when sometimes he would have only $2 to his name, less than $2 to his name, when he would have to pawn his typewriter, borrow his friend's typewriter, pawn that typewriter, <laughs> just to eat. Through the years of his great masterpieces, The Glass Menagerie, A Streetcar Named Desire, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and others and the catastrophe of success that followed. In the gallery, you'll also find first editions of many of Williams's books published by James Laughlin of New Directions, as well as original dust jacket art by Alvin Lustig, generously loaned to the exhibition by New Directions. And I'd like to thank everyone at New Directions and to the other lenders and funders that made the exhibition possible. Also on view this season is Power and Grace, drawings by Ruben, Rubens, Van Dyke, and Jordans. Now and Forever, The Art of Medieval Time, an exhibition of illuminated manuscripts, including a 60-foot scroll detailing the genealogy of the kings of France, and Peter Hujar, Speed of Life. This is the first retrospective devoted to the downtown photographer whose mature career paralleled the public unfolding of gay life between the Stonewall Uprising of 1969 and the AIDS crisis of the 1980s. Peter Hujar and Tennessee Williams actually met once. It was a brief, fleeting encounter, reminiscent of many stories I've heard over the past few years of fleeting encounters with Tennessee Williams and of great friendships with Tennessee Williams. I hope that everyone will have the opportunity to visit the current season of exhibitions, and I'll take this opportunity to thank all of our members in the audience, and if you're not a member, to encourage you to become one. Your membership supports the Morgan's exhibitions and public programs, such as tonight's. Our programs coming up include a spring family fair this Sunday, the Boston Early Music Festival with John Rondeau and Harpsichord next Thursday, a gallery talk for Tennessee Williams on April 20th, and a symposium on imaging techniques on the 25th of this month. You can learn more about the Morgan's programs and how to become a member by picking up our calendar of events on your way out of the auditorium. So, a great 40-year-long friendship is the topic of tonight's discussion. Tennessee Williams and James Laughlin, the founder of New Directions, first met at a cocktail party in 1942, and the two immediately connected over their mutual love of the poetry of Hart Crane. Their correspondence has just been published in this book, The Luck of Friendship, and tonight we'll hear from the editors Peggy L. Fox and Thomas Keith along with award-winning playwright John Guare about what those letters reveal about one of literature's most enduring friendships. It's my honor to introduce tonight's speakers. Peggy Fox was Tennessee Williams's last editor with a play at the printer when Williams died in 1983. She worked closely with New Directions founder James Laughlin from 1975 until his death in 1997 and is his co-literary executor and a trustee of the New Directions Ownership Trust. She began at New Directions in 1975, handling contracts and copyrights and foreign rights. She became senior editor in 1983, vice president in 1994, and president and publisher in 2004, retiring in 2011. After taking over the preparation of Williams's manuscripts from the then managing editor, Peggy edited Williams's poetry and the last plays published during his life. After his death, she initiated a program of publishing his unpublished work, beginning with, short, with the collected stories and all of the early plays, such as Spring Storm and Not About Nightingales, and two volumes of letters. After her retirement in 2011, Peggy has continued to be a member of the New Directions Board of Directors, as well as a trustee of the New Directions Ownership Trust, She's also a trustee of the Thomas Merton Legacy Trust and the E.E. E. Cummings Trust, both of which oversee new and reissue publications of those authors. In 2012, she was awarded an, an honorary doctorate in humane letters from her undergraduate university, Wittenberg University in Springfield, Ohio, 
for her work in publishing. She and her husband, Ian S. McNiven, Laughlin's authorized biographer, live in Athens, New York. Thomas Keith worked for 17 years as an actor off and off off Broadway, regionally and on television with directors and playwrights, including Tom O'Horrigan, Edward Cornell, Terry Gilliam, Peter Hedges, John Vaccaro, Maria Irene Fornes, Jeff Weiss, Sharon Ott, Clifford Williams, Catherine Long, and Ellen Stewart, among others. From 2001 to nine, Keith worked as full-time editor and later as production manager at New Directions. He began editing the Tennessee Williams titles for New Directions in 2002 and continues to do so as consulting editor. In 2010, Keith began teaching theater and acting at the Lee Strasberg Institute, Ohio University, the Atlantic Theater Company Acting School, the University of North Carolina Greensboro, and currently at Pace University in Manhattan. Moderating tonight's discussion, it's my honor to welcome award-winning playwright, John Guare. He's best known as the author of The House of Blue Leaves, Six Degrees of Separation, and Landscape of the Body. He's noted that Tennessee called James Laughlin his literary conscious and was his greatest and most trusted friend. And that because Tennessee and Laughlin were both wildly peripatetic, their, their paths rarely crossed, ensuring that their bond would live on in their correspondence. The luck of friendship shows us a rare side of Tennessee in his interactions with that rarest of individuals, James Laughlin. So after tonight's program, we'll have time for a few questions, and then our speakers will be available in the lobby to chat and sign copies of the book. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I was very uh, pleased, honored to be asked to, to moderate this, uh, this discussion between uh, two experts in the field of Tennessee Williams uh, and Jay Lockman, whom I met only once at Drew Hines, at the house of Drew Hines towards the end of his life. And I must say, I was, always had heard about him, but I was not, we had a long talk and I was not prepared for the intensity of his charm. He was almost seductive. Mm -hmm. And I, under, I said, oh, what a, an extraordinary quality for a producer, uh, for a publisher and a producer. But uh, uh, he was, uh, tell me, how did New, New Direction, New Directions, how did it come into being? Well, Jay liked to tell this story himself, and he was a very seductive in, individual. I, I always say that he operated New Directions on the principle of seduction, not in the Me Too uh, sense at all, but he would seduce you into, into his mission, which was to uh, publish the world's best literature and to continue what he called the revolution of the world, the word. He thought if somehow, if, if we could write better, if, we, if, we, if literature were pure, that somehow that we would all think better and that the world would become a, a, a better place. And, and, and people have thought this over, over the years, but he was somebody who, who actually tried to live it. And he, at, he started as a student at Harvard, actually at Choate, he, he, he became enamored of, of great literature and he went to Harvard, and, uh, but he found it rather dull. He went off to Italy, he, he had been introduced to, to the work of Ezra Pound, he spent a uh, some time at what was called the Ezuversity. Well, I wonder, I read about that, but I, what happened in the Ezu? I didn't know whether it was well, easy, easy, easy versity or Ezuversity. Ezu, Ezuversity. Ezuversity. Uh, what, what happened at the Ezuversity was that you read what Ezra told you but to read. But with Jay, with, with the other students. He was the only he, pupil. At, it was a one, it was, he was the only pupil at the time. And he just showed up at his house, knocked on the door. Well, he wrote to him. He, yeah, he, he wrote, he wrote to him, and, and Ezra, so, and said, uh, come in, yeah. Well, the, it, it goes back a little further because Jay went to Europe. He ended up uh, writing press releases for Gertrude Stein for several weeks. Why is that the funniest title? A press release, that's a good, I must use that for a title. And, 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 and he, uh, you know, he, he would take uh, Gertrude and Alice on drives. He ended up changing the tires in this old car. And then after several 
he, Again, he, did he just show up? Not he, he, just, he basically yeah. just showed up yeah. there. At, but he, uh, and he, they had these yappy little dogs, which he didn't like, he said. Uh, but he, uh, but Gertrude sent a telegram to Ezra and uh, that she had this young man that she thought he should get to know, and uh, she said he was another great white hope for literature. And, and Ezra sent back two words, visibility high. And so on that, the strength of that, Jay went to Italy, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the Ezraverse, he read what Ezra told him to read, what year is this now? We're talking, oh, 34. Yeah. Yeah. 34 and, and 35. 30, 34, and then he went back again in, in 35. Um, but did Ezra Pound assign him things to read? Yeah, he, to he told him, you've got to read this one. You've you got to read Bill Williams. You've got to read... Uh, that's, well, that's how we found William. William Carlos Williams, Williams yes. Uh, and, and he listened to Dorothy Pound read Henry James in the afternoons, and he and Ezra played tennis together. That was the curriculum. And, and, then, and, and, and then I will tell you, so when, when, when Jay left, he said, because uh, his great passion, he was going to be a great writer. He wanted to write poetry and novels. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to do this in a Jay, because they talked in Ezra, and they talked in this cracker barrel, fake cracker barrel uh, drawl. Oh, that's where the literature comes Liter from. That's where the literature comes in from. The title in of the title of, 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 his, uh, of Ian's of Ian, biography, of his, yeah. yes. Uh, Liter literature is my beat. That's how somebody asked, once asked Jay, well, what do you do for a living? And he said, literature is my beat. But that came from Ezra Pound. And that came, that, that spelling and that, uh, but anyhow. So he, sa he, said, he said to Pound, well, do you think that I'm, do you think I'll ever be a great writer? Because I guess he showed Pound some of his poetry. <laughs> and Pound said, no, don't think you're going to make it. And he, and then he said, he said, well, boss, he said, I always called him boss. He said, well, boss, what do you think I ought to do? And he said, well, why don't you go back and be a publisher and publish people like me and Bill? He says, you got enough brains for that, I suppose. No. That's, that, that's the story that Jay tells. Now, Ian, Ian my, in his biography, says it probably, it, it, you know, it, it, but that was the story well, like that the Jay Italians, developed. The Italians, they always believe the best story. Right, right. There, exactly. There are variations, and one of the big ones is, get, well, why don't you do something useful and become a publisher? That's right. right. Do something useful is another, another variation on, on that. But anyhow, he did go back to Harvard, and he did start New Directions as a sophomore. Now, today... Sophomore? At Harvard. Really? I mean, today, people at Harvard start Facebook in their dorm yes. room. Back in 1936... <laughs> Back in 1936, he started what became a world-class publishing uh, company. So he published his first annual and in 1936. Who, who, was his, who did he first publish? The, well, Pound. the annual was the first book. The annual had in it Ezra Pound, William Carlos Williams. Uh, I think there was some Henry Miller. Uh, there was E. Cummings. There was Wallace Stevens. There was Elizabeth Bishop. Uh, Zuk I'm not Zukovsky, Lorraine Niedecker, Kay Boyle. Kay, I was going to say Kay Boyle. And did he just pray, he wrote them out of the blue? Or he wrote them out of the blue. He said Ezra Pound, or, or, or Pound wrote to certain people, and, uh -huh. and, and, and then he got to know Bill Williams a bit, and Bill would, you know, and what, they would say, you know, you ought to listen to this guy. And he published uh, the first anthology. How many copies? Oh, golly. Uh, Does it still exist? 700. I mean, I, I've been, uh, you've been you, reading you've up been, on JL the last few do weeks. Do people yeah. have, I mean, do copies exist or were they, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, th there are, you know, and most of them. And did he sell them? Was it sold on? Yeah, he, he sold them. He, he Out of his car and his uh, dorm Yeah, room. He, would, he would go around and he, he you know, and uh, he, he was, uh, but anyhow. And he, his fortune was already available to him. He well, had. no, no, he did. He was on pretty short rations. He had, an, his father had settled some money on him. Out of which steel, he had steel money. Steel, steel money. money. Jones and Lachlan Steel Pittsburgh. Uh, he. Uh, we decided not to go into the business. He didn't want to go into the family. He business. didn't want to go. He did not want to go into the family business. So he, he, his father had settled some money on him. He had the income from that. He was, he was, he was very guarded with his money. He only used the interest. He never touched the principal, and so he had enough money to go to college and a little left over to fund something like the anthology, and his aunt 
uh, Aunt Lila Carlisle and his mother were soft touches sometimes, and that's how and that's how New Directions was funded in the early days. But he, really he did not have access to a uh, any large source of information. Because he says somewhere I read somewhere that he said that luckily since he had he was rich he could keep people in p print that normally uh, a, well, a, more, a more realistic publisher would let drop. Yes, he, he did not, he, he for ran, the entire, ran for the, the entire, red for 25 years. Well, yeah, and, and, and he worked out subsidies with his mother and his aunt and whatever. But once the country, uh, once the company started to be in the black, all he cared about was that it kind of stayed in the black. And what was the first so success they had? How did it, what, how did it, become not a college whim and become a, a well, lifetime? Well, he, start, he, he started to get a reputation. Uh, he, uh, he, he published an annual every year, and then he started to publish Bill Williams. Uh, and he, uh, B Bill Williams' White Mule was one of Williams' novels. William Carlos Williams and Ezra Pound, I saw them so interesting, were roommates in college. Well, they, yes, they, they, they knew, one I don't think they were roommates, but well, they, I mean, knew, they knew each but other they in stayed, college. But they stayed, but they had long night talks about yes. Ezra Pound saying, we have, our future is in Europe, and uh, my, William Carlos Williams saying, our future is in America. And H.D. was the, the girlfriend of both of them. Hilda, do Hilda, Hilda Doolittle. Doolittle. Yes. The, at, at, at the images, images poet. The images poet, at different, at different slightly different times. And what was the first book that he published in the first official book? Uh, the first New Directions book was Who's Been Tampering with My, P My Pianos, Montague O'Reilly. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Où est Montague O'Reilly, a new name? It's a, that's a pseudonym for um, Ian. It's a whole bunch of Chinese people. Yeah. Uh, Wayne Andrews. Wayne Andrews. Uh, pseudonym for Wayne Andrews, who was a great architect and 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 popularized the boxes of Joseph Cornell. And was it a, a book of fiction or essays or poems? It it it, it, it was a sort of uh, surrealistic romp. Whatever. Whatever. Whatever yes. you say. Anyhow, we've got it. We've got to get to. We're, we're, no, we're no, no, but I, no. I just wanted to know what. Tennessee yes. was coming because it had a reputation. But because yes. what year does Tennessee Williams? All right, so so we're six years on into uh, when they meet. Uh, the company has been going for six years, and Jay is starting to get a reputation. Is this enfant terrible? You know, of, of publishing. He's he he writes these uh, uh, introductions or prefaces to these anthologies about storming the literary barricades and and. We've got to cut out the dead wood, and 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 um, he's um, and he's getting a reputation for being this is the this is the place if you have any aspirations to be a an avant garde an experimental writer in America this is the place to go. He's publishing Pound, he's publishing Williams, he's starting to publish other people. Uh, and, and, and there was no place else to go. And there was, and the, the, it was the, the depression. It was the, the only one. The one he wanted was E. Cummings, and Cummings was rare among the great poets that he, who had a publisher who stuck with him. So, mm -hmm. so, but they were friends. They they were good friends. But we, uh, Tom's going to tell us what what, what Tennessee Williams was, was what, what Williams was doing at that period because. They, well, and I'll also say because it's important for these first two letters that. Um, Poetry readings, other than very formal, stuffy affairs at certain kinds of colleges, were unheard of. They weren't, they weren't popularized until Dylan Thomas was a big success. There were very few literary magazines, and most of them were sort of regional ladies' poetry following on Edna St. Vincent Millay and those popular poets of the 30s. And there really weren't any experimental journals or annuals like Jay was publishing. So that was important. And then the other thing, would you want to tell about when they met first, or shall I prep? Oh, I can. No, I'll prep on it. I'll go ahead and prep that. Is, is, um, uh, in 1942, uh, Tennessee Williams' claim to fame was that he had had the Theater Guild produce one of his plays, which was a huge critical and financial disaster that closed out of town in Boston and never made it to Broadway. Uh, he the opening night, there was uh, the, the uh, stage effects. The backstage smoke went out of went out of control, right. and the but it smoke was the League the of it was the League of Decency that had a bigger say so in it closing because they didn't like the content, and the critics raked him over the coals, and 
1942, at the end of 42, he was an elevator operator, and he took tickets at a movie theater. The Strand. And he was, <laughs> and he had an agent from the, who he, Audrey Wood, who he had already. So he was being sent out, but he wasn't a catch. You know, there was no looking at him necessarily and saying, this is the guy that you want to publish. Uh, and a year later, uh, after he started working with Jay, he got a job, uh, Audrey got him a job uh, writing screenplays for MGM, a six-month contract. And after three months, they didn't renew his second part. They didn't fire him, they paid him to the end, but he wouldn't do what they asked him. They said, write a, something for Margaret O'Brien, and he said no. <laughs> and basically, he spent his time working on his own stuff, including the gentleman caller treatment. And then he started writing a, they assigned him a, a screenplay to write something for, for Lana Turner. And uh, he called the screenplay The Celluloid Brazier. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, right. and but what, I fi what I find really interesting, I've written, uh, tried to write a play about this, is that uh, in order to stay working at MGM to c collect that $250 a week salary, which was unheard of, he started writing something that might be suitable for Lana Turner, which turned out to be Grass and Azure. And uh, so with the history of uh, the history of masterpieces is uh, <laughs> so the Lincoln Kirsten party. Yes. So as as Carolyn said, they they met at a party given by Lincoln Kirsten. Now Lincoln Kirsten is the was the co-founder of the New York City Ballet with George Balanchine, who was also a, a, a literary impresario. And Jay always told the story that they they met at this party by pure happenstance. He was. He knew Lincoln Kirsten at, at Harvard. He, uh, Lincoln Kirsten was a little bit older. And, and tall, Jay, and they were both tall. They were tall, and, and Jay was one of the few, uh, I think he was the only undergraduate who was allowed into the Ararat Supper Club, which was uh, an exclusive salon that Kirsten had up at, at Harvard at the time. Well, uh, so he, Jay was going to this cocktail party, and there in the corner of the bedroom was this sad little man in a corner with a torn sweater and, and a backpack, and, and, and Jay said to himself, there's somebody who needs a friend, I'm, and he w was going to go over, and, and he befriended him, and they got talking, and they found out they both loved Hart Crane, and, and, and this little guy confessed that he sometimes wrote poetry, and they talked some more, and Jay said, well, I'm a publisher, why don't you send me some? Well, uh, as, as Ian uncovered in his for his biography, uh, the week before, Tennessee had uh, written to his mother, I'm going to Lincoln Kirsten's for a party and I'm going to meet this publisher. I do hope he likes me. So it wasn't quite as, uh, and, and Jay never, and I'm sure that Lincoln Kirsten had said, there's this guy I want you to meet. So it wasn't quite, as, as you say, Jay had found a better way to tell the story. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but they did, uh, they did hit it off. They did both love Art Crane. And um, so, Thomas, why don't you read that? Uh, uh, so this is, this is Williams' letter. first letter to Locke, to JL, uh, December 15, 1942. Dear Jay Laughlin, Lincoln tells me that your name is Jay, not James. I hope you remember our talk about my poems at Lincoln's Sunday night recently. Well, I have gotten most of the long ones into fairly presentable shape. But of the short ones, there is a bewildering number to choose among. I'm wondering if you plan to be in the town, Manhattan, anytime soon, so that instead of mailing the only existing copies of a great number of poems, only a few of which may be acceptable to you, it would not be better for us to get together and sort of go over and discuss them informally? With a sensitive poet in the grand manner, such a business might be a violent ordeal, but with me, I promise you, it would be extremely simple and we would inevitably part on good terms even if you advised me to devote myself exclusively to the theater for the rest of my life. <laughs> Any way that you want to do this is all right, just let me know. I might even be able to deliver them to your office at Norfolk, Connecticut, if that seems a better plan. Of course, I'm excited over the possibility, and I do hope enough of the poems are sympathetic to you to make it work out. Lincoln sends his love, cordially, Tennessee. And then in January, uh, Jay replies, Dear Tennessee, I am very excited with the poems you sent. It seems you, to me you are a poet. Some of the stuff is rough, to be sure, but it's studded with nuggets. You have some of the wonderful quality of El Yord, strange insights that reduce to highly poetic images. I'm keen on this stuff and want to do something about it. 
We'll be down in New York before long. We must get together and plan it out. I'll call Lincoln's office when I get to town and leave word where I'm staying. Best wishes, JL. And, like and it, was, it, it was necessary for Tennessee because that was the only game in town for a serious, if you were a serious poet. To get a start. To, to get a start, yeah, yes. To not, yeah, to get a chance. And I, I was digging around through there. The, uh, this book is part of a series of um, uh, volumes of letters of JL's most famous authors and himself between himself and Ezra Pound, William Carlos Williams, Kenneth Rexroth, Thomas Merton, Henry Miller, who did I leave out? Uh, Guy Davenport. Guy Davenport, and then now We're the Old Maids. And so I started digging through those, and I found in the William Carlos Williams volume, right after he gets uh, a second letter from Williams uh, with the one-act play, uh, The Purification, he writes to William Carlos Williams, uh, you ought to know a kid named Tennessee Williams, a protege of Kirsten, who has sent in a really beautiful piece of stage poetry. The kid has it, I think, that beautiful lyric excitement that was in Lorca. Quite a kid, wears a sweater and pants, very self-possessed, has no address, etc., but seems to live all right, in with the Broadway gang and also the Piscotter crowd. Broadway doesn't seem to have spoiled him yet. And then in that wonderful way, which you find these letters when people are not writing for posterity, they repeat themselves, we find a lot of drafts, whatever. A month later, he writes to William Carlos Williams. He's been discussing the paper uh, rations. It's, it's the war's on, and he's got a very limited stock of paper he can use, and so he's telling William Carlos Williams with his next book of poetry he's going to do it somewhere else. They've, they've agreed on that. And he says, it will give me quite a twinge to see you coming out with anyone else, but I do want to save the little paper I have for really exciting things and for new kids. By the way, I've located one who really thrills me. A funny lad named Tennessee Williams, really poetic in the deep lyric sense and the damnedest subject matter and flashes of insight. I think you'll like him. Wow. And then, um, they, they, so Tennessee does send him a group of poems and uh, they decide to publish it. There's a volume coming out, uh, Five Young American Poets, 1944, so that'll come out the next year. And uh, Tennessee is going to be one of those, and the, his section is going to be called The Summer Belvedere. And John, would you read a couple of prefaces? Or yes, the, uh, the Tennessee, Tennessee uh, wrote to Jay Lachman, uh, P.S., I have written two prefaces. The first one seemed a little too serious, and the second a little too frivolous. So I'm letting you choose. I think the serious one is probably better. My agent just wired me. I am signed up in Hollywood, must go to New York first, and then to the coast. I will try to pass through Salt Lake City. And Tennessee, or JL responds to Tennessee uh, from, not Salt Lake, but from Alta, Utah, where he has, with a, a, a legacy from his uncle that he's just gotten, bought the rights to develop the ski lifts at Alta, Utah. And that, that becomes Jay's second passion and second business. And uh, so he's, he's out there in, in Utah with the ski lifts, and, uh, and he writes back to Tennessee in May, uh, thanks for your prefaces. I like them both in their different ways. Why not run both? Frivolous preface and serious preface. It's a good angle, don't you think? Hope you can stop off here on your way to the coast. I haven't seen a soul literary for months. Not that I'm trying to insult you by including you in a category which includes Parker Tyler, etc. But what I mean is that skiers are very nice, but sort of one-sided. <laughs> Wire ahead and I'll meet your train or plane. Really, I only lost one manuscript in a truck, and that was later found, so keep up your hope. Hastily in regards, Jay. I don't worry in the least about Hollywood spoiling you after the training you've been through. I rather like the place. I have a good friend there, Alvin Lustig, a Jewish boy who looks like Jesus and designs very well. Do you want to meet him? And there's a little what? Poundian thing there, Hollywood. Huli, yes, Hollywood. it's spelled Hollywood. It's and 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 that that was. Uh, well, it, this, the thing about that is that Alvin Lustig designed all the covers for New Directions yes. and all those legendary, iconic covers for Tennessee Williams plays. And you plays. can see Glass a lot Menagerie, of them. Are in, are you can see it at, at the exhibition, yeah, the know, Glass the, Menagerie cover, the streetcar cover. There's one thing I just want to say that uh, struck me when, when Jay says, and I, I really I only lost one manuscript in a truck, and that was later found. 
uh, I love that Delmore Schwartz read that he lost a manuscript of Delmore Schwartz's that he sent out to Alta, and Delmore Schwartz wrote back and said, do you want to be a publisher or a playboy? It was very, very <laughs> harsh, yes. How do, tell and do you, and do you know that th that lives in, 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 uh, uh, in, in literary lore because uh, in uh, Saul Bellow's Herzog, uh, no. Yes. P Herzog, the Playboy publisher, no, it's not Herzog. Yeah, the Playboy publisher is based on Jay. Yes. Yes. So Saul Bellow probably heard that from Delmore Schwartz. How? Someone was, was asking me about the cordiality in these letters because they're so polite to one another. That doesn't mean they're not witty, they're down to earth, they, they joke, but there's still this sort of cordiality which. It's a side of Williams I've never seen in. In all his in his well, letters. I've seen it in other letters, but it's consistent for forty years here. And um, uh, oh, what did I? I can't remember what you said that made me think of that. But um, yeah. Well, Should we we'll go, go on? on? Yes. Um, so sh shall. Yeah. Why don't, why don't we have John read the literary conscious, and then I'll give you some context on that. So. Okay. Because th this is a. a this is after Menagerie. This is in 1945. So Menagerie has come. Oh, but just say one because it's very interesting in the history of that it, Jay was not the original. Uh, Tennis was only published by one other publisher. And tell about Bennett Cerf in Tennessee and Random House in Tennessee Williams. Er, early on, he accepted yes. an advance of $200 from Bennett Cerf around 1941, sort of Shylocky, and it was for the next work of Bennett Cerf's choosing. And Tennessee forgot about it. And, and I thought he didn't tell his agent. Did he tell Audrey? Did Audrey Wood know about it? Because a lot of times he would do these things and not tell her. No, she, she knew about it. And, and, but, and, but and by all, this time he was saying that, uh, uh, to, he was saying to Jay, I want all my shy intrusions into the world of literature to be through new directions. And then when Glass Menagerie was a big success, Bennett Cerf pounced and said, I'm now I'm exercising the agent. And they couldn't get out of it. And so Random House published the, the, the first edition of Glass Menagerie, but they let it, uh, but as with most things, after a year when it was no longer selling, and I think that happened with plays very often, yeah. that it, it, then, then, new, then New Directions came in and said, you know, and, and leased the rights and, and they made a new contract. And, and so, uh, Has it, do those later, they must be rarities, those random house copies of, of Glass Menagerie. They must they be, are. they must be. And, 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 and of course, the cover was done by Alvin Lustig, of the new directions. Yes. 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 And then the deal with Random House was, after a year, we've, we've sort of sold what we think we can sell. You can have the rights, and you know, as long as you would arrange it with the writer, and they kept the anthology rights. They, 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 they managed oh, to keep so they the still have them. No, they don't. They they worked it out with the University of the South. Oh, interesting. Yeah, but so anyhow. But but was uh, did Glass was that a big windfall for them? Had what what six was was that the biggest success w New York New Directions had had up to that time? Well, well, it didn't get to publish it when it first came out. I know, so but I mean, but no. in the long run, it, it in the long run in the lo in the long run. Uh, yes. Tennessee, uh, Tennessee's work, uh, Menagerie and. Streetcar uh, are perpetual bestsellers. Yes. yes what right. was the first bestseller that Jay had? Sheltering Sky by Paul Bowles. Oh, who did not stay with Jay? No, uh, that was another. He defa that was another, another. And then Siddhartha. No, that was. Uh, it was a bestseller at some point. Oh, then Siddhartha. Then later on, Siddhartha, Siddhartha became. But oh, talk about but he lost Paul Bowles left. What other writers left Jay? What, or what writers didn't he get with his legendary charm? Well, one that he one that he 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 felt that he should have had, but he was a gentleman about it. Was he became friends with Thomas Merton uh, uh, through um, uh, a, a common teacher that they had at at Harvard, and uh, after Merton went into the uh, Merton, as uh, many of you know, I'm sure, but many some may not was. Uh, uh, Went into the, uh, became a Cistercian monk and became one of the great writers of uh, Catholic works during the 50s and 60s and is still a very great bestseller. 
but he, uh, he was writing poetry, which is what Jay published. Uh, and uh, he, he did one of the, Merton got a Poet of the Month pamphlet mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in, the, in the 40s. But this, uh, his, the bestseller was The Seven Story Mountain. Was that published by Newt Drake? No, no, it no. Wasn't. That's uh, Jay thought he was going to get, and, and he had gone down, and they were they were really very close friends. Uh, and the reason that, that I'm uh, a trustee of the Merton Legacy Trust is that Jay was the first trustee of the Merton Legacy Trust, and that, and he wanted me to follow in his steps, which eventually uh, I did. So that's how I became involved in Merton World. But uh, Merton uh, had. Merton's age had an agent too, and she sent it to Bob Giroux, and Giroux snapped it up immediately. And Jay felt that he had that Merton had promised him first, you know, a first look at it. But it didn't, but he, it didn't cause a rift or anything. No, no, he 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 was a gentleman about it, and they went on. As well, what about people like I mean, like Nabokov or Elizabeth? Well, Bishop. that hurt. Nabokov hurt when when he introduced people like Nabokov and Pasternak and. and a whole bunch of foreign writers, and 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 uh, when Nabokov left, that you know, but basically Jay said he wanted to keep New Directions small. Uh, he wanted to keep it where he could read all the books and be involved in all the decisions, and he didn't want to capitalize it in the way he would have had to do to, oh, to so get the big advance. What he had said, what you had said before, just to keep it in the black enough. Yeah. Yeah, just to keep it in the black enough, and that meant when somebody became. Uh, um, popular enough or was making enough of a splash that they could command a much bigger advance, then, uh, then they had to go away because Jay simply could not and, could not and would not meet the, the kind of upcount advances. And, and it he, comes up later in the book with the memoirs. Yeah, right, yeah. And, 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 and that comes up, yeah. Oh, I see, which doubled it, yes. I, yeah. uh, I see, I never, I see. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. very interesting about um, how does he deal with Tennessee's the catastrophe of success? How how does how does Tennessee decide? Would you read this literary? Yeah, why don't you letter? read this? And th this sort of answers that question. Oh, in oh, a way. I'll, okay. I'll answer my Page own question. Four. Yeah. <laughs> Wednesday, 3:30 a.m., November 14th, 1945, Boston. Dear Jay, I'd hoped you'd have more time and less company last night. There's a lot I wanted to talk over with you, mainly my work. I have a childish need right now for reassurance about it, more than usual. And that is why I started reading things to you. It was not out of vanity, but out of self-distrust. I've become suspicious of myself and what I've been doing, perhaps because of the vast alteration or improvement in my manner of living. You are my literary conscience the only one outside of myself, so I am overawed by you, and it isn't easy to talk to you. I am disturbed by your apparently real dissatisfaction with your own life. I would be glad to have you tell me. I would glad to have you tell me more about it if you, I am ab if you think I am able to advise or help in any way. We should have two or three bottles of champagne last night and talked a lot more. We should have had two or three bottles of champagne last night and talked a lot more. Please let me know when you have another evening in New York, ever, Tennessee. And what was the dissatisfaction in, uh, in Jay's life? His, his marriage. His marriage was breaking up, uh, and his, his first marriage to someone he had met on the ski slope in Alta. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, he, it wasn't going to last because he, he really needed somebody who could share his interests in, in uh, literature. Mm -hmm. And so he tried to interest her, in Margaret. He, he gave her a magazine to run called Pharos, and the first issue of Pharos was Battle of Angels. Right. But really. so, so, and this is the background I wanted to give on this. At this point, Lachlan publishes Williams and Five Young American Poets, 1944. He publishes Battle of Angels in that special issue of Pharos. Um, when uh, the Glass Menagerie is playing in Chicago, which Jay went to the opening of. Um, 27 Wagons Full of Cotton is at the printer. It's about to come out. So he's publishing in this way, and then he has this huge success. And it, it opens on Broadway in March, uh, wins the Drama Critics Circle Award in April, and this letter is in November, and it's connected to that 
essay of Williams where he talks about the catastrophe of sex, mm -hmm. success where he kind of lost himself. Um, and just to back up a little bit, in mid-1944, and one of the many times that J.L. was pushing him and saying, send me some of your stories, Williams sent him a story called One Arm that is about uh, a former sailor who becomes a lightweight boxing champ and is doing rather well until he gets into a car accident and loses one of his arms. And he turns to hustling. And he becomes a gay hustler in New Orleans, and he's very popular. And he eventually roams from city to city hustling, and that's how he makes his living. And then he agrees to do a porno film. And in the middle of shooting, he doesn't like the way the director is treating the leading lady and gets mad at him and gets in a fight with him and then ends up killing him. And he ends up in jail. And from jail, over the course of several months, he starts to get letters from the John who remembered him, who read about this in the newspaper, and who have these feelings for him that he didn't connect to the sex that he was having with them. It's a fantastic story. So uh, he writes this letter to Jay, and Jay doesn't say, but you're this huge successful playwright. You just won awards. It's all the things that you could possibly say. What he, his response is, uh, I have to rush off suddenly to Utah, basically excuse the shortness of this letter, while I'm away, write me something as good as one arm, or write a story as good as one arm. That's his response. So he's addressing Williams as a writer, as an artist, which was invaluable to Williams and would be invaluable to anybody. And there's questions about, well, you know, how, how much was Laughlin sort of like you know, the care and feeding of a writer who makes money over the years. And there, there had to be some of that. That's, all, you know, it's inevitable. But he also was genuinely fond of William's work, especially his experimental work. And um, he encouraged it. He continued to encourage it. And I found a quote from a letter in 1973 where he's been reading some of William's stuff. So this is however many years later. Uh, and I like the story in Playboy, too, the inventory of Fanta... Fontana Bella, very randy and almost guignol, with your own special blend of black humor, but with so much more color and wit than most of them, the Barths and Roths, can manage in that genre. I trust that Bill Barnes' agent is keeping track and will let us know when there are enough for another collection of them. So he always, all through his life, there was never a moment where there was a, a, a lapse of faith. No, 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 and they had some rocky times, and, and people said that, well, how come they didn't get in big fights and whatever? Well, Williams was fussy at times. They had a few things, but it, none of them were huge. And again, I went to the other volume. Rex Roth wrote him these diatribes that are just stunning. Rex Roth <laughs> wrote Jay Lockman. Kenneth <laughs> Rex Roth, you know, I'm quitting, and just all kinds of horrible stuff. Henry Miller told him, you're a publisher, and they're the worst enemies of writers. You know, he obviously had a tough time at times with Ezra Pound. Uh, Delmore Schwartz was always writing him an angry letter about what he did or didn't do. And Laughlin said, um, the writers who I don't publish hate me, and the writers who I publish hate me. <laughs> I, read a, I read a wonderful detail that Jay Laughlin went to visit Henry Miller, but Henry Miller was out, and he, he ended up in bed with Henry Miller's wife, and they ended up in the shower, taking a shower together. And Henry Miller walked in, and he looked at him, and he said, oh, yeah, it's a hot day out there, and left. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, when you bring up Delmore Schwartz, there's one thing, uh, uh, something that was so intriguing. There's a wonderful collection of what, what, what I wasn't. What is it? The way, the the way, way, it, way it wasn't. It's yes. a wonderful, is that, can, is that a new That's direction? a new direction. It's a brilliant alphabet of the life of... Uh, the editors are here. Barbara so. Epler and, oh, it's and a, Daniel it's Javis it's are probably glorious, up there somewhere. It's, a, it's physically a beautiful book, but it's so much fun to read. Uh, for, it's so juicy, but in it, uh, Delmore Schwartz says that I have written a letter. I've written your letter not to be. Oh, I've written a letter not to be open until after my death. That will change the way we think about so many writers, and I don't want it to be open until after your death either. What was that letter? What's in that letter? I have letter? no idea. You've never seen that I've letter. Never, no. It was a De bluff. It was a bluff. A I don't think it exists. Damn, I'm, we're going to find, <laughs> find that letter. But, I mean, and, and Delmore, you know, was paranoid, schizophrenic, whatever. And do you know who paid his psychiatrist bills? No. Jay Lockman. 
Of course. Of course. Well, tend to see paid other people's medical yes, bills. Yes, yes, yes. He, he learned that from Jay, I bet. Yes, yes. yes. Talk about about tennis, oh, you know, about disquiet in in both their lives. What about the introduction of the craven Maria's Lady Maria Saint Just? <laughs> that what was, if, what that was Tennessee's doing. Was that yes? That, did Tennessee set that up too? Why did, was he doing? Is it a favor for, for to get? Did did Maria was she behind it to get? To get involved, I mean, it was well, well, Maria was behind it for she wanted a rich husband. Yes, and just about anybody would have done. Yes. Well, R Maria met Tennessee at uh, a party given by John Gilgood, I believe. The opening of Glass Menagerie in right, 48. In, in 48, and 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 Maria told me this herself. You know, she said, "Oh, and they became friends, and they were both brought up by their grandmothers, and and la da da, and they came, and and then." And she, she had her designs on this rich playwright, and then she realized that that wasn't going to work out so well. And, turn, and Well, so and she also tried with Gilgood. She tried it with several gay men. She really pushed hard to try to get to, to marry them. But, uh, but then she met, so she met Jay through Tennessee. I don't, I don't, I don't think at that point Tennessee was pushing anything, but, the, they, but they met, and she... You didn't need to push Maria. No, no, this is true. This is true. And uh, and then she and 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 uh, in in the in the book uh, in 1995 I realized that this was a year a couple of years after Jay had asked me to do this volume and I realized that his health was you know starting to decline and so I went up and over several days I did this long interview with him. Um, about Tennessee, and I, I, I had organized. He had given me copies of all the letters, and and I had organized them, and and went through and asked him about, them. and and and, and, and it, it's been there. And I then I used snippets from that interview as section dividers in in the the correspondence mm -hmm. volume, and I asked him point blank. I said, "Well, what what was it about Maria that was so?" Because he was engaged to it. He, he became engaged. They became engaged for a very brief time, and and he says, "Well." She was just so much fun, he says. You know, but I realized that that she was going to want to go around the world spending my money, and and Jay wasn't going to have that. And 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 Maria told me the story that the re how he realized this was they were in Rome, and she went out and, and he always you know wore these ties that had food stains on them and everything, and and you know wasn't and, and so she went out and bought him a whole week's. Uh, 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 seven Italian silk ties, one for each day of the week, and he was so <laughs> appalled by her extravagance that, 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 he, that she always says that that's what tipped him over. That and he, did, his mother, did his mother get him out of that and say, no, you can't? Well, as, I, as, as we were talking later, when you said you met him at Drew Hines's, I said, well, Drew was the one who told him he couldn't marry her. So that's the connection of Jack Hines, Pittsburgh. Yeah, Jack Hines and, and, and Jay were great friends from, from uh, Pittsburgh days. They had gone to the same Presbyterian church. Uh, in their adults, they became skiing buddies. And uh, Hines's third wife, Drew Hines, who I she just weren't just The died. great Drew died. And she was a, uh, she was, I mean, again, like Jay Locke, I mean, she sponsored so many things at the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the American Academy in Rome. Uh, the Paris Review. There were so many things that she kept uh, just kept alive. And 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 she said, and I and 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 when I, in this interview and it's it's in the book, she says, he said, well, it was Drew Hines who told me I I forbid you to marry that woman. And 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 Jay realized that he want, he he basically knew that while he enjoyed Maria's company for a couple of weeks at a time, but. Then, then, but then, when, but then he, he went off to India. When Tennessee died, Maria got control of his of Tennessee of Tennessee's yes. estate. Yes. Yes. And to ter not to, to do no. That. He appointed her. He appointed her. He yes. appointed her. Yeah. So she, she never got she never got out of his life. Yes. No, no. No. I mean, and he did that was strategically. He was thinking of his sister, and he knew yeah. that nobody would be as ferocious as Maria in terms of taking care of Rose, so she wouldn't lose her position. Oh, that's. If you want to see, it's always curious. You want, Maria Britneva, Brit Lady Maria St. Jude, who's this ferocious creature, the, she wanted to be an actress, but the only time she ever got a job, she's in the opening of Suddenly Last Summer as one of the patients 
the camera pans over the, the, the faces, snake pit. The faces of the insane asylum where uh, there's Maria, there's Maria St. Just and then Elizabeth Taylor and the story begins. <laughs> but, I uh, was thinking, you know, one of the things to John's credit, and you may not know this, is that he wrote a magnificent introduction to Tamino Real, which is a really important play in, in William's writing and in his life. And on the page seven of this that we pulled out, there's a section where JL writes to TW and then TW to JL. Would you, Peggy and John, read that? Uh, okay. So, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm first. This is, this is after um, uh, Cameron O'Reill has appeared on Broadway. And Walter Kerr said it is the worst play by our best playwright. Right. And so uh, and this was, is March. It was for the day, it was March, much too experimental for commercial. Right, theory. it was very experimental, it was very poetic, uh, kind of abstract, a lot of dancing. And this is March 26, which is Tennessee's birthday, 1953. Uh, the Jay writes to him, uh, I'm sorry that I didn't get a chance to see you before you went off to Key West to tell you how much I enjoyed the play. Certainly it is one of your finest works and full of beautifully poetic passages. I think I have two main objections to the direction. First, it didn't make the actors speak the lines of poetry the way I think poetry should be spoken on stage. They don't bring it out properly. Kazan is just too Hollywood for my taste. He seems to think more of motion than emotion. He clutters up the line of the play with a continuous scurrying around of busyness on the stage so that the audience's attention is continually distracted from what is being said and meant. The real feelings of the play, its philosophical depth and tragic beauty, never managed to cut through all that scrambling around. He gets it now and then, in the love scene, for example, where he just lets the actors be quiet on the stage and do justice to the lines. But most of the times, it, it is obscured. Well, this is all water under the bridge. It's a lavish production, and I don't set myself up anyway to know anything about the theater. But I keep feeling in the back of my mind that you will only be able to realize the full poetry that is in you when you forget about Broadway with all its stereotypes and limitation and look around for some small theater somewhere which has an audience and a management that really cares about poetry and the imagination. And, ten and Tennessee responds uh, April 5th, 1953, uh, from Key West. I want to thank you for the never failing appreciation you have for anything good in my work. Your letter meant a great deal to me since I went through a pretty black period after those notices came out. I had suspected that we would be blasted by a quorum of the critics ever since New, ever since New Haven Gadge and I had expected or feared it pretty certainly. But even so, there was a degree of militant incomprehension that seemed like an order to get out and stay out of the current theater. I'm glad you felt poetry in Cameron O'Reill. I can't agree with you about Gadge. I don't think this play was nearly as easy for him as Streetcar was or, or Death of a Salesman. It was a much harder and more complex job, and he was working with players, at least half of which were dancers and had no previous speaking experience on the stage, in an adequate budget and far from adequate time in rehearsal and tryout on the road. Gadge is not fond of verbal values as he should be, but of all Broadway directors, he has the most natural love of poetry. Not a single critic seemed to have any sense of the abstract, formal beauty of the piece. They concentrated on what each thing might mean in a literal, logical sense. And I can't help thinking that there was a general feeling of ill will among them at what seemed new and intransigent in the work. A couple or three nights ago, I got a special delivery letter from Edith Sidwell, couched in the most extravagant, heartfelt terms for which I was rightly overcome with gratitude, and there had been a flood of letters from people known and unknown more even than I got during the whole course of Streetcar, saying their love of the play and anger at its reception. So although it is a great, almost overpowering professional setback for me, I don't feel altogether hopeless about it. Your advice is good. I, I have nothing more to expect from Broadway, and if I go on writing plays, it must be with an absolute uncompromising fidelity to myself alone. That is quite purely from now on. They say on good authority that the life expectancy of an American literary talent is about 15 years, and I have already long exceeded that mark since I got my first paycheck for writing at 16, and I've written every day since that I was able to punch the typewriter keys, and very few days when I, when I wasn't, when I wasn't can be, very few days when, when I wasn't punching them can, can be remembered. But I think the pressure of things to say 
is as great as ever, if not greater, but a lot of the native energy is depleted and the time has come up to let up a little, shift gears, work under less steam. It would be a good thing if I stop altogether for a while, but I find my daily existence almost unbearably tedious without beginning it at the typewriter. He started work on Katna Hutch and moved to Fuge days later. <laughs> oh boy. And now what about his mental state? What now, well, thanks to new directions, uh, led to a terrible period in his life through Bob well, McGregor. It was already a terrible period. Uh, but he was having an awful time in the early 60s um, with the critics, with himself, with his own recreation, you know, his, not recreation, but his own non-prescription use of alcohol and drugs had gotten out of control. And uh, he was separated from his longtime partner, Frank Merlo, who was then dying of cancer. And uh, Bob McGregor, who was, we haven't mentioned yet, he was Lachlan's right-hand man at New Directions from 1950 to 1974. And Jay made a point of saying that uh, McGregor had to be a part of all these volumes because he got to know the authors and he edited them and he got, he got very friendly with uh, Dylan Thomas and Tennessee Williams particularly. And so he's, he's part of the correspondence in here. Uh, but in one of the letters he says, you know, you, what you ought to do is go see Dr. Max Jacobson. Miracle Max. Who was known as Dr. Feelgood if you haven't heard of him. And he came up with these shots that were full of hormones and uh, speed and all kinds of stuff. Truman Capote, John Kennedy. Uh, a lot of movie yeah, stars. Alan and, J. Lerner. And they don't even know fully because nobody was studying it. There was no Betty Ford uh, clinic or anything. But he was on these for about six years. And, and, and they drastically altered people's personalities. So throughout the 60s, when people will go on the, 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 the you know, known narrative of Williams being a mess, that was part of it, was that he was trying to... Um, numb himself. It was a blend of uh, vitamins and amphetamines. Right. right. And um, so he was having a rough time. And there's on the next page, there's a great exchange. And this shows a lot, again, about their relationship, because this is 20 years after they met. It's on page nine. And John, if you, John, would, read if you would read the yes. TW. Yes. Again, uh, from uh, September 24th, 1962, Key West. Dear Jay, you'll get the acting version of The Milk Train Doesn't Stop Here Anymore as soon as the actors get it so you can aim at publication dates sometime prior to its execution on Broadway. I'm also finishing up two long, short, or short, long plays, The Canonicus Fräulein and The Mutilators, under the common title of Two Slapstick Tragedies. I think they have a new quality for me. Perhaps <laughs> they're my answer to the school of UNESCO, but they're, they're not just funny. They're also supposed to be sad. I mean, touching. Who is touched and by what is the big question these days, which are the days of the untouchables, the emotional astronauts from which I'm beginning to feel like Louisa May Alcott or the early Fanny Hurst. <laughs> uh, J.L. wrote back October 1st, 1962. Your phrase, the emotional astronauts, spelled not as a not, N-A-U-G-H-T, really hits it on the button, the kind of days into which the whole population seems to have fallen, drugged by all the bilge that comes over the air and off the page, so there is this unbelievable apathy about the nuclear arms race while people sublimate what's left of their souls playing Walter Mitty, John Glenn on trips to the moon. I must say I'm disgusted with Kennedy. I had great hopes that he would turn into somebody with a touch of greatness. But as far as I can see, he's just a politician. And the next thing, we'll be trying some crazy stunt in Cuba or elsewhere. If he calculates it, will get him reelected. The Cuban Missile Crisis was three weeks later. Um, and let's not, uh, I would love to see you really tear into this unlife, as dear old E. Cummings would have called it, situation with a tremendous give em hell satire. Maybe that's what you're getting toward with the slapstick tragedies. Just turn loose, no holds barred, you end up. on everything that is wrong with our so-called culture. I don't know what the form would have been, perhaps the sort of thing Breck did or some of these new dramatists. I haven't followed them as closely as I should have, probably. It seems to me that life is absurd, as the existentialists claim, but that these birds who are writing theater of the absurd haven't quite found the equation for making high drama of that fact. They let themselves fall into a kind of self-deluding verbal comedy. What I suppose I'm trying to say is that I hope you will let yourself go in one play, be wilder, perhaps savager, pour out all your resentments at the state of things, a bellow of thunderous rejection, 
regardless of whether it fits into the conventions of formal drama, the well-made play. Cam No Real was, I have always felt, a protest play, and a very good one too, one of your best, but I think there are other ways of doing it too that you ought to explore. An impertinent, I guess, of me to try to suggest what you might want to do, but nobody writing today can beat you in insight into people or command of language to figure out what you have seen, and I would love to see you really let fly. So there again, he's not, he's not well, one of the voices saying you've got to have a hit, you've got to make money. You no, know, what, what's great is, I think we should come to the end right here, is, is that uh, Jay never let up on him, never let up on him, and what I admire about uh, Tennis, he wrote and wrote every day of his life, and, uh, and you've been editing. What was it like to edit Tennessee at the last, at the, the last period of his life? Uh, Tennessee was always the perfect gentleman with me. Uh, uh, he, the, I'd only met him in person a couple of times. Uh, uh, Jay would, you know, take me out to lunch with the two of them, and I, you know, I never said anything. I just let the two of them talk, and they were wonderful to listen to. Uh, were they, what was it, was it old friends? Were they yeah, it was, it was two old uh, friends and they would reminisce about, you know, what time they spent in Key West or time they spent in Rome with Gore Vidal or, or something like that and they would laugh and they would, they, they were just, they were just really, you could tell they were so totally comfortable uh, with, with one another and um, so that we were, uh, and uh, we were working on clothes for a summer hotel uh, the, which had failed miserably on Broadway, but we were finally, we were bringing it out and, uh, in, and I had worked on it with Tennessee, and this is where Jay... Hey, I'm just going to interrupt. Do you yeah. want this as well? Because um, you had said you wanted it. Let's, uh, let's wind it. Let's yeah, let's okay. wind it up, yeah. and then we, we, can, we can do that in the question period. Okay. okay. Uh, but, uh, but we're, we had, Tennessee and I had been working on Closure at Summer Hotel. It had gone, this is the kind of question he would ask me, uh, or I would, in, in the, um, uh, I had, in the proofs, I had written a query. I said, he had, he, the Closure at Summer Hotel is about Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald, and as part of it's a, looking back, he called it a ghost play. And he, uh, uh, he, he has one of the characters saying something about anorexia nervosa, and I had written in the margin, I'm not sure that this was, term was used in the, in the 1920s. And Tennessee wrote back, he says, it's a ghost play and I can say whatever I want. Well, yes, sir. <laughs> Are there any questions we have? Well, we no, have we're, we're going to, we're we're th we want the tribute. Let's, let's have the tribute. Um, and I'm going to key, key this up, so Tennessee, uh, I sent the proofs, uh, he sent me the proofs, and I had, a, he said he was going on a trip, I said, Oh, this there's, is January of 83. This is January of 83, I said, you know, there's this uh, uh, tribute, uh, dinner for JL honoring him at the National Arts Club on the 25th of, of February, uh, he'd love it if you could be there, and I, this is on the phone, and Tennessee said, well, no, he was going on a trip, uh, I said, well, if, when you return the proofs, could you, could you write something? Uh, and he, he, uh, he did, and he sent it back, and so I got it to the right people to be read uh, that night, and, and the, uh, the morning of the 25th came the news that Tennessee had died overnight. And the accolade, and the accolade to Jay Lachlan that Tennessee wrote, maybe the last thing he wrote, was uh, read at the National Arts Club Awards Ceremony in honor of Jay. And Jay was at that. Yes, yes, yes. and he, he spent the morning writing a poem about Tennessee. Tennessee called death the sudden subway. Just, what a great, pure and, Tennessee. But anyhow, this was read. Okay, let's end the, we'll have no questions. I mean, let's just end it right here. Okay. I mean, I think this is, this is, I think where Tennessee should have the final word. It said, it was James Lachlan in the beginning, and it remains James Lachlan now, with never disruption or moment of misunderstanding in a friendship and professional relationship that has now lasted for 40 years or more. By nature, I was meant more for the quieter and pure world of poetry than for the theater into which necessity drew me. And now as the time for reckoning seems near, I know that it is the poetry that distinguishes the writing when it is distinguished. 
that of the plays and of the stories. Yes, that is what I had primarily to offer you. I'm in no position to assess the value of this offering, but I do trust that James Lachlan is able to review it without regret. If he can, I cannot imagine a more rewarding accolade. Tennessee Williams, 1983. Thank you so much. Buy this book. It's Thank you so much.